But I mean, the fact of the matter is, is Sam needs to be arrested. Sam needs to be subpoenaed and Sam needs to wind up in jail. Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Trade to Black podcast. I am your host, Shad Dales. We're going to get into a lot of hot topics here today, including cannabis, FTX, amongst a number of other things. But before, as usual, we begin this podcast, all views on the Trade of Black podcast and the guests on this podcast are purely opinion. You should not treat any opinions expressed by us or our guests as investment advice. And the views on this podcast are solely intended to be informational and are not investment advice. Okay, let's welcome in longtime no see millennial entrepreneur and the host of the new TDR Web3 podcast, Proof of Work, Anthony Verrill. Good to see you. How are things? Good, good. It's uh, it's been good. It was a good week in uh, in New York. Um, just thanks to the Benzinga guys for hosting us. Yes. Um, and pumped to get the Proof of Work podcast out. I mean, we had some strong guests um, to interview for the first couple of episodes, and I'm really excited to get that property out there. Including Mr. Wonderful in a vehicle. He was very, very impressed with the uh, interviews that you guys did. So uh, that's great to see. Yeah, I mean, it was great. I mean, I, I, I had a completely different picture in my head um, as to how it was going to go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, a guy like Kevin, he's busy. He's on a tight schedule. It's I do this, bam, 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 bam. I thought we might have had 20, 30 minutes. Um, next thing I know, we were in the car for like an hour and 10 um, shooting. And it was just a great, natural, very knowledgeable conversation um, on, on everything from cooking to crypto. Um, so it was a, uh, it was definitely something I'd like to do again. All right. And we'll see that full piece, uh, this week on our channel, I assume. And, uh, you got talked about cooking, food, wine, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, everything. Um, I mean, we, we want to kind of bring in some angles where we can get some, I guess, human aspects to it. Just yeah. Not be just crypto web three, crypto web three. Um, and I mean, he's a, he's a pretty good chef. I mean, I like to cook, so it was some common ground. Um, to find some pretty interesting conversation. Well, I think the one good thing too is that, you know, I think enough has been told or asked about FTX, the situation. I think he gets right into details as to what we can expect next and forward thinking statements, which is important, which brings me in is yeah. Ben. Good to see you, my sir. I know we uh, have a lot to talk about and uh, dive into this week about forward thinking statements, but how was your week? It was a great week. I, you know, personally, um, again, just following the markets, follow the cannabis market very yeah. closely and, uh, you know, unfortunately, some of these things didn't come to pass for some cannabis investors, but we'll get more into it. But other, yeah. otherwise, it's a good week for me. Well, let, let's let's begin with that. I think a lot of people will say, oh, gee, you're really surprised. I knew this was all going to happen. I think it's the way it happened. You know, Marijuana Moment was actually reporting that McConnell went as far as bragging about this marijuana banking defeat and defense bill. Um, signally, he's going to fight to stop it in omnibus spending, too. Um when you look this on paper, it doesn't look promising for the industry. Were you, what was your, I guess, flat out, Ben, what was your reaction when you read it uh, like this? Well, my first reaction was for cannabis investors who had been waiting patiently so long for some reform to move the ball forward. Uh, it, you know, I feel bad for them because, yeah. you know, there's anticipation. The market moved up a little bit. MSOs hit, uh, I think, three month highs. It was looking, the momentum was there. And once mm -hmm. again, Turtle McConnell came in threw a turd in the punch bowl. Uh, you know, he shut down safe, basically saying it's not the right vehicle. Why you, you know, basically calling it a poison pill in not so many words for the Democrats, putting it in safe, doesn't belong there. And then, as you said, he shot down the possibility of putting safe banking in the omnibus, right? right. Which, uh, you know, is probably a more appropriate vehicle than the NDAA, although you could argue that, you know, the NDAA is appropriate too because of, you know, uh, transfers of cannabis cross border and stuff like that trafficking, but it doesn't, you know, from his language, unless he's posturing on getting some sort of negotiations as what happens in Washington, sometime talk tough, but you use that as a negotiation ploy, unless that's happening, it really does not look promising. And the problem with that is then, then you get the new Congress in, uh, it's going to be a Republican house, although something could come from the house from reform later on, because the house is more amenable to uh, uh, led, uh, re legislation, it's still other priorities I think might take place. So who knows how long it's going to be before reform comes back into right. the Senate. So classic McConnell throwing a turd in the punch bowl. He's just a, an absolute albatross for this sector. Well, I hate to ask the softball question, Anthony, but are you surprised at all? At, at all? I don't even know why we're still talking about this, to be honest. <laughs> um, like, I understand it's like a big deal, like obviously the regulatory front. But I mean, this is what the third time they've done this. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm honestly, I've got my cannabis positions. 
I'm not buying a goddamn thing until it actually gets signed. I don't care if I miss the first 20% to the upside. I'm not, I'm, I'm done going back and forth and getting yo-yoed. Like Canopy Growth is ripped on this news and then it retraces on this news. Mm -hmm. MSOS rips on this news and retraces on this news. Like I said, I mean, I've got my core positions in Curaleaf, in GTI, in Canopy. I mean, the day's going to come, but until then, like, this is all white noise. Like, there's no point in sitting there hanging on every thread. McConnell's doing this. Schumer's doing this. It's, it's just a back and forth and a back and forth. And the government right now is so fucked up that, I mean, this stuff is just, if it panders to the crowd, they'll use it. But you're not going to really see a lot of execution on it. Really, I don't, I don't know when. Um, I'm, I'm kind of blocking it out, to be completely honest. But, I mean, I'm not selling I'm not going to lose faith in what's going to happen with cannabis. Yeah. But I mean, this has got to be driving people crazy by now because it's, unless you're trading it, if you know you're what? trading it, you're, you're making a decent amount of money. You know what? I just want to add something too. And I think the disheartening aspect of this is you actually don't know what's going on. Cause when you think about it, okay. Correct. Schumer had the COAC that he, that he first uh, signaled was coming to market in July of 2021 right? From day one, people looked at what was in the bill and said, this has no chance of passing. It wasn't even yeah. close. It was, it was a, everybody knew it. Analysts, investors said, not a chance. 25% tax on cannabis revenues and all that, all that kind of thing. It was impossible. It was too much. So he went all the way to the end, introduced it. And of course it didn't have support. And now uh, there's word that there's at least 60 or 70 senators that would pass safe now. So all Schumer has to do is is table uh, is is schedule a standalone vote, and apparently there's enough votes to pass safe, and yet he won't do that. So Why? from an it's investor, smoke, it's smoke and mirrors. Well, that's I mean, what I'm smoke, saying. From an investor standpoint, you don't, you don't know yeah. if they actually want the possibility. This yeah. almost looks like a yeah. dog and pony show where they're both protecting I mean, big pharma and blaming the other side. You don't. It doesn't look like either side I, really I, wants it. Yeah, I mean, I hate to be cliche, but what crushes markets? Uncertainty. I mean, this is the most uncertainty you can possibly inject into mm -hmm. the system. That's why at this point, I'm just like, it is what it is. Like, there's nothing wrong with just stick, just staying put and just missing the first leg up. But once that starts to leg up, we're going way higher to where we where we used to be sitting at. But I mean, it's it's all bullshit. Like, uh -huh. it's you see all the guys going back and forth on Twitter. Um, all the CEOs, a couple of the guys that think they're lobbyists and think they've got the inside scoop on what's going on. And then the influencers, they're all just going back and forth and back and forth. And they honestly have absolutely no idea what's going on. Um, so, I mean, I'm just, it's, as far as it's, I'm concerned, it's, it's white noise. Okay. So we're approaching mid December based on Mitch McConnell's announcement this week, Anthony, what will happen to cannabis stocks going into 2023? I mean, they're probably going to be, they're probably going to get hit hard for tax loss selling. Um, I mean, it's, it's probably an easy place to, to tax loss sell. Um, especially if you got in last year held and been holding all year, I wouldn't expect a leg up here anytime soon. Ben, you agree with that? Well, the tax loss selling would happen in December. So if you're asking what's going to happen in 2023, it's very hard call because I think we're going from a macro level, uh, we're going to go into recession, uh, the the ten year yield is inverting big time, and that's a that's a very reliable of, of recession indicators, and it could be a hard recession. So the bottom line is that you expect MSOs with the weakness that it's been experiencing. Do you think it's going to be the salmon upstream and sort of fight the macro trends and go higher? It's kind of hard yeah. for me to believe that, right? Um, so. No. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't like the, the market. All I can tell you is the industry is not going to move until we get that federal reform, because then that's going to signal other things like 280E downstream. Right. So if we don't get that, I don't see how MSOs is going to fight the market like the salmon mm -hmm. upstream and go higher. So I would be pretty fairly bearish to neutral in the in the near term. It looks pretty uh, dim as far as like what 2023 uh, holds in front of us at some point in the next 12 months, will we turn the corner or do you believe question for both of you that we could be in for a recession for uh, an extended period of time? Anthony, what's your thoughts? Um, extended period of time? No. I mean, I think the first three quarters of 2023 are going to be pretty rough. Um, I mean, I do think we go into a textbook recession um, but it's all been it's all been manufactured by by the Fed raising rates and I mean increasing the cost of capital. Um, I mean, 
unemployment tech tech companies are slashing jobs like it's going out of style mm -hmm. that might change here but i mean i think you need to see some trend shift in corporate spending um consumer sentiment i mean everybody that i know right now is like everything's expensive um like i'm not i'm not spending what i used to i mean stuff is is genuinely going up in price and i mean most of the people that i'm that i know are usually not price sensitive to a lot of things um like like going out to dinner and, and buying just they they spend discretionary income quite loosely um those people aren't it's tight um so i mean i i don't expect it to be to be positive at all i mean i'm short the market right now on the spy and on the qqq and i'll probably hold those till march um and and keep adding mm -hmm. ben yeah I, I echo that statement i think uh again the bond market is inverting um, and that's a very reliable, uh, indicator. It's not just inverting a little bit, it's inverting a lot. It's the most since like 1981. So I think obviously the cost of capital is going up and, and it is being engineered. Anthony's right. Uh, you know, they're ramping up interest rates, which doesn't even really make sense because as we talked before on the show, it's, uh, it's really a supply chain issue. It's not a demand driven inflation that we're seeing. Uh, it's, it's broken supply chains in different markets that is really hit and oil and stuff like that sanctions. It's really other things other than supply or demand driven uh, inflation. So why do you think they're still trying to, to use this. monetary? So why ahead. do you think they continue to do this then? Uh, that's a, well, that's, I think that they're using the, the monetary tool uh, that they know the classic raise interest rates to, uh, to squelch demand and that will have an influence on price and it probably will it will to some degree but the problem is again we have a supply chain issue uh for a lot of these things cost of energy issue from russia and stuff like that although that's gotten a little bit better recently and that's going to be hard to suppress inflation that's not a demand driven inflation it's a supply chain driven inflation so the effect on monetary policy i think is going to be more limited than it would be mm -hmm. if you just had mm -hmm. everybody had tons of discretionary uh income and they're just spending like you know drunken sailors on on on, on discretionary goods right mm -hmm. driving up prices it's not this is not the type of inflation we have we have very low savings rate high uh, credit card debt and supply chain issues which are ramping up the cost of goods and monetary policy has a limited effect on that yeah makes sense uh one last announcement i wanted to ask about the uh cannabis industry canopy growth usa they converted 125 million canadian dollars in tariffs and debt to exchangeable shares at five dollars and ten cents per share still a lot of unknowns related to this announcement we're hoping to have jason wild on this week to walk us through but um anthony if you look at this announcement um you know the headlines so to speak still a lot of unknowns as i've said uh what do you think of this announcement I mean, I think it just foreshadows where Canopy is going to go. I mean, I think Canopy in the long run owns Terrasend. Um, full disclosure, I mean, I'm a shareholder in Terrasend. I've got okay. a decent position in Terrasend um, from when I invested in Gage, which I still haven't sold since the stock collapsed on itself from five bucks down to a buck something. Um, but I mean, I think it just foreshadows what's going to happen in the future. Ben, what do you think? You agree with that? Yeah, obviously. Yeah, no, I big time because uh, if there's one big takeaway I got from this is that obviously uh, Canopy LLC um, is very confident in the long term future of the company, right? They converted the outstanding debt, which is 125 million Canadian into basically the equivalent amount of exchangeable shares at a 100% premium in this market. So I'm still trying to actually wrap my head around why uh, such a big premium was, was given by Canopy LLC. Um, but either way, it, it does for mean that, uh, they, they have a positive, uh, long-term outlook for the company. And obviously it's good for Terrasen as well, because they're going to save, uh, about $10 million a year in debt servicing costs. So that's going to help them, especially in these times where there's still 280E and, you know, the tier ones are fighting to, you know, to get to a, a positive cash flow level and, you know, keep their balance sheets intact without raising more capital. Well, we all love to do this. We love to speculate, love to speculate, but why, if you had to speculate, uh, do you think there was a premium put on that? Well, uh, I could see the, you know what? I, I don't honestly know. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I think it's because Canopy LLC had a chance to get into shares, which they see from the long term is going to perform really well. So if you're looking, if you're looking at, at it from like a now basis, it kind of is like, why would they pay so much premium? But they're not yeah. in it for now. They're in it for no. when legalization eventually happens and they're in it for a 10 year timeline. That's how these 
uh, corporations generally work. So they're looking at this probably as like a huge deal. It's like we get to exchange our debt to shares. And obviously, Terrison wouldn't exchange you know, the, their debt to shares at today's market value. There had to be some sort of premium. Um, so they're probably looking at it from 10 years out saying, okay, Terrison, there's going to be legalization then. They're going to be in the U.S. This is going to be a $30 stock or $40 stock. And yeah, they're looking at it from point, that perspective saying point. that's a huge deal. If you look at it right now, you're like a little bit like, whoa, that was quite the, quite the premium that they paid. But, yeah, that's for sure. Okay. Um, this week, let's shift to crypto now. We were at the uh, Benzinga Crypto Conference, Anthony. Um, a lot of big, uh, big names that were there. Uh, when we first showed up, there was uh, Kevin O'Leary was there, Anthony Scaramucci. There was a pretty good panel on place. They were asking a lot of questions related to FTX and Sam Bankman Freed. And Kevin kind of outlined as to like, he's got his legal team in place. They're going out. They're trying to find out exactly where his money is. Will he get his money back? I don't know. But he had some valuable information to share about the uh, future of the uh, the overall industry. But what was your big takeaway and the sentiment that you experienced while you were there this week? I think so, that sentiment was great. I mean, the, the one thing that was so that was I guess great to see is no one was talking about price action. Okay. I mean, everybody was kind of like, all right, well, we are where we are. I mean, Ethereum's been in the twelve hundred range. Bitcoin's been bouncing around from nineteen to sixteen, and and I mean, it kind of it is what it is. Um, I mean, I think Kevin's approach to the FTX fiasco is probably the most sound argument um, I've heard. I mean, he, he wants to conduct a forensic audit, figure out where his money is, figure out where everybody else's money is, what actually happened, and then make an assumption from there. I mean, he lost a lot of money. I've seen yeah. a lot of bullshit on Twitter right now. How he got paid a $15 million fee um, to be a brand ambassador for the company. I mean, it is what it is. He's a spokesman. That's what people get paid for. Um, I mean, FTX was making a lot of money. They weren't necessarily just siphoning off consumer funds to pay people like Kevin O'Leary to be their spokespe to be their spokesperson. Kevin just happens to be a prominent financial professional. Um, he also happens to have a very sound understanding of crypto um, and and how everything works. And I mean, he's a bullish he's bullish on it on it moving forward. Um, he happened to also lose a lot of money um, in FTX, which I mean, due to his personal affiliation with the company. I mean, he's been very adamant that he did not um, deploy his investors funds into the company. The company, the capital that was deployed was his personal, um, his personal capital, which I mean, is, is, is by the book. And I mean, is kind of what you would expect. Yeah. Um, but I mean, the fact of the matter is, is Sam needs to be arrested. Sam needs to be subpoenaed and Sam needs to wind up in jail. Um, Maxine Waters, who he donated money to, um, literally said, I have no interest in subpoenaing him. Huh. I mean, he misappropriated $10 billion worth of consumer funds and was loaning them out to the CEO of the block.com. It comes out yesterday. He was loaning them to employees to buy millions and millions of dollars, hundreds so of millions of dollars I, in real estate in the Bahamas. I got to bring up this question on paper. This seems like, yes, of course he's, you know, should be in jail. What do you think's going on here? You know, as far as like why he has not been subpoenaed yet. Like, is there another story that's creating or developing behind the scenes that some may not understand, but maybe the few that are connected can put the dots together that do understand? If so, what is that story that is developing? Yeah, I mean, I don't really want to go down that rabbit hole, to be completely honest. Um, I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, but I mean, you got to look at it this way. <clears throat> the guys from Tornado Cash, they had a couple lines of illicit code in their programming. They were arrested within two days. Yeah. Um, Sam squandered and illegally transferred and was incestuous with $10 billion in consumer funds. Now he goes on a media tour playing the village idiot um, that he had no idea what was going on and he has no idea what works. Uh, FTX Japan, FTX US, they are fully solvent as far as he knows. Like he's the CEO of the company. Like I run a decent amount of businesses i know exactly to the dollar where everything is at any moment in time right. and sam is i'm gonna just go out there and say it a lot fucking smarter than i am um there's no way sam didn't know where capital allocations were, were, were going where and and what back doors and what was being moved where i mean the only thing that that i could say and it's i, I don't want to get my tinfoil hat on is he paid the right people mm -hmm. um he he paid the right people yeah. he's might be being protected to an extent, but I mean, he was grossly negligent, which is illegal. Um, and I mean, he should be arrested and he should be thrown in jail. Anthony, um, you nailed it right there, is, I think. 
it, you, yeah. you know, I mean, he we, donated a hundred million dollars to the democratic party. Right. So I think yeah. he's, you know, he's, I don't know. I, I obviously, I, I don't know for a hundred percent sure, but it sure seems from my perspective that, uh, he's being protected because he was a big donator to yeah. the you know, Democrat and, and apparently the Republican saying, party. too. Uh, I was going to say, I'm not necessarily saying he's being protected by Democrats because he did donate to the Republicans yeah. as well. That's right. Um, he donated to the Republicans silently, but he did donate to both sides, which I mean is smart because you're going to need votes from a, from a partisan yeah. perspective to push anything forward. Um, but I mean, he, his parents are both law professors and run a super PAC. Yeah. for the Democratic huh. Party. Um, yeah. He was a big donator um, to the to, to, to both parties, and, and he was big in politics. I don't think he steps foot on U.S. soil uh, maybe ever again, um, but it's, it is it, it is what it is. I think it's a travesty, and I think it's just a joke, but it's also indicative as the way the world works right now. So the positive spin is that this had to happen for the industry to evolve and grow. No, so, no that's, okay. there's no positive spin that this had to happen consumers and people are killing themselves people's lives were people's well-being was 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 disrupted i mean people lost millions and millions of dollars this did not have to happen right um for 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 crypto to take a next leg up like that narrative is complete bullshit okay so what does then happen to crypto moving forward it gets regulated yeah it's it's this is going to force regulation um i mean i've seen narratives from both the cftc and the sec um, Gary Gensler again. Um, he is a so he's associated with fucking bank with SBF's father. Um, they're friends. Um, Sam obviously has probably been in conversation with him um, around stablecoin legislation and around DeFi um, legislation. But I'm hoping that this falls under the purview of the CFTC. Um, the chairman of the CFTC had quite an insightful um, testimony to uh, politicians about two weeks ago, where he's like, look. This thing is too big to get regulated out of existence. It, we don't care if it fails. We don't care if it succeeds. All we care about is that there's guardrails that are in place to protect the consumer, yeah. create a regulatory framework, and make sure that this doesn't happen again because, I mean, this is egregious. Like, the trust in the system has been broken. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be rebuilt, um, but I think we've got a long ways to go um, until we get to where we, we need to go. One of the things I've kind of rolled my eyes recently is just a lot of these traditional equity businessmen that are just sort of trashing saying, I told you so, like the Jamie Diamonds of the world. If you were sitting in a room right now and they're saying, told you so about crypto, what would you say to them, Anthony? I mean, there's not, you don't really have a leg to stand on, um, to, to, to be honest. I mean, one of the narratives, too, that I heard a lot of Benzinga, the underlying technology of this stuff works. Ethereum works. Smart contracts work. NFTs, when applied to real life use cases, they work. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if you're a market participant in any of this stuff and you can't actually admit that 95% of this stuff is greater fool theory, Ponzi schemes, and just things that were engineered to enrich the founders and enrich the people that were insiders um, of these projects, then you really don't have any business being out affiliated with any of this stuff yeah. moving forward. Yeah. But the same thing happened in the dot com boom. I mean, this is literally the dot com boom all over again. Like these well manias. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 these manias welcome bad actors. They foster bad actors, but they also build AOLs. They also build Googles. They also build Yahoo's and Apple's. Um, and I mean, those companies are going to come out of this. Um, and I mean, it's, it's a matter of kind of just staying the course and, and if you believe in it, great. I mean, you probably will do well in the future. If you don't, there's plenty of other shit to invest in. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it, it's not the end all be all. Okay. Ben, you're a sophisticated investor. Um, you understand the mindset of what institutional buyers are looking and what they want to buy. Um, you obviously invest majority of like the traditional, uh, finance on the equity side of things. Um, when you look at this industry and I know you don't follow it as closely as Anthony, but you have been following it just to see the developments on this FTX story. Uh, what do you think is the mindset of institutions, uh, on this overall industry, both short term and long term? Oh, I think that uh, the institutions are obviously going to stay away, and that's why, to a large degree, uh, they have stayed away. Not everybody, because you have like Teachers Fund in Ontario. They invested, what, $230 million that they're writing off. So there, there's some institutional participation. But going forward, 
there's got to be a lot more uh, regulatory framework in place because yep. no one wants to get burned again. As we've seen with FTX, just like has been uncovered, just the, the complete lack of fiduciary responsibility from Sam Bankman Freed and from some of the associations that they were uh, lending capital to or receiving capital from, it, it was just like, there was just no checks and balances were completely egregious, right? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Uh, and then you end up happening what happened with the collapse, right? Everybody losing their money. So I think, you know, you're to get a lot more, to get the industry back on track and get more institutional participation, it could probably, there'll probably be a renaissance because institutions will probably come in bigger next time, but you're going to have to get You're that regulatory to. framework in place uh, before you're going to get the confidence of, you know, the teachers pension funds and all these funds to, to get back in the industry. Yeah. All right, gents. Great conversation this week. Um, Anthony, before we go, we've got a new podcast that's kicking off. It's going to be this week. Uh, it's called proof of work. You want to maybe outline what it is and what it's about and what we're going to be featuring. Yeah, I mean, it's I've been since I've been in the Web3 space for about a year and a half ago. I mean, every time I either talk to my parents or anybody else, they're kind of like, all right, well, like, what do you do exactly? Kind of like that line from Office Space. It's like, well, tell us what you do around here. Um, I mean, that's how Scotty and I kind of came up with the idea. Um, it's how we came up with the title. And I mean, it's taking prominent executives, VCs, um, influencers and, uh, and founders um, from the Web3 space. And I mean, having a having a pretty open conversation about how they're applying their, I guess, Web2 or, or, or traditional industry um, experience to, to the Web3 space and get really getting a fresh perspective um, on it. So, I mean, we'll have a ton of uh, ton of different guests ranging from professional athletes to, to VCs to founders. Right. And uh, right. covering topics on the relevant topics on the, on the Web3 space as well. What do you think are the top two or three questions that people that don't understand Web3 ask? And how do you plan to answer that? Um, I mean, the top questions are probably like, how do I get involved in the Web3 space? And I mean, anybody that asks me that, I tell them, look, download a MetaMask, load up $100, go on YouTube, Mm. figure out how to transfer crypto, figure out how to swap crypto, figure out how to buy an NFT, sell an NFT, trade an NFT, um, figure out all that stuff and figure it out on your own. I mean, it's, it's what I did and the tools are out there. You can figure out literally anything that you want to do from transferring an NFT to auditing a smart contract and being able to comprehend solidity. Um, it's all out there. It's just a matter of being able to, uh, to, to, to sit down and have the discipline and actually do it. Um, and then just really what, what do you think the future is looking like in the industry? I mean, I think it's a lull right now, but also I think it's, it's a pretty good barometer of, I guess, confidence that Ethereum still sits at 1200 bucks. Um, I thought we were going down to like the, the hundreds of dollars. Mm-hmm. I mean, anywhere between like two and five, a uh, hundred bucks, um, on the price of ether. So, I mean, we're stable. We'll see where it goes in the future. And I mean, I think it's, it's brighter than ever really for, for the crypto sector. Well, it speaks your co-host Scott Braun. Um, t- you want to touch on him. He's a host at the major league baseball network and what he's going to bring to the podcast as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I met Scotty a couple mo- or about a year ago um, in New York at, at NFT NYC. We kind of hit it off, and then I brought him on to be the chief content officer at Only Gems. Um, and then we've uh, we, we've kind of just built a relationship through that. And I mean, I think he brings a fresh perspective to the Web three space. I mean, he's he's good at distilling it down into uh, into layman's terms and and helping me kind of create a digestive narrative um, on the space so people can actually understand and apply. Uh, what's going on in the show versus having to have a PhD in in computer science and engineering to really understand what's going on. It's great. Well, um, having the best thought uh, leaders and VCs within the industry to educate and learn is important. It it gets off no better way than with uh, Mr. Wonderful Kevin O'Leary that you guys did interview this week in New York. Kind of cool that you got him away from the actual uh, venue and into a vehicle. Did he like it? Yeah, he had a good time. Did he? Um, he had. A, 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 you'll see directly by his demeanor on the show. Um, he was engaged, and he was. Uh, it was. It was a great conversation. What's he like? He's cool. He's a cool dude. Yeah. Um, he's he's cool, calm, collected. I mean, obviously very well spoken, um, but colorful. I mean, it was. Like I said, it was it was a really good and enjoyable conversation. That's good. So they'll be uh, posting that this Tuesday and Thursday on the Dale's Report channel. So that's exciting. Congrats. Ben, I'll let you go. But before you go, you got any uh, got any ideas on um, how this Sunday will perform? Actually, when this podcast gets released, most of the games will be done. But for the Sunday nighter and Monday nighter, any predictions? In NFL? 
Yeah. This week is a tough week. It's been a really, really good football season for me this year. Uh, but this week is tough. Uh, I don't really have any confidence on the line, but I know that's boring, so I'm going to give something. I'm going to say uh, Dolphins, if I had to choose one game. Dolphins and, and Chargers. Dolphins? That's the Sunday nighter. Dolphins. Take Dolphins. But Where's I'm not confident in that. Is that Miami or L.A.? It's in L.A. It's oh, a, wow. Dolphins, Chargers. So Miami said it. All right, Ben. I like I like the confidence. That's too cross. <laughs> we got our ass. We got our ass whooped last week. They got to go oh, to California you? two weeks in a row. Wow. No, no, no. no. They stayed. They oh, they, they, did. they okay. stayed out west. Yeah, yeah. After the Niners game, they didn't come home. They went straight to SoCal. Oh, that makes sense. Um, hey, Shad, we did really yeah, well. Yeah. We we took the Lions, right? I was all over the Lions last week. I know you were too. I I, I took the Lions. I actually had the best week of my life. I actually got a free bet from uh, the company that I. Uh, um have an account with and it was like a 50 dollars free bet so i just thought oh what the heck use the house's money so i did a 17 parlay <laughs> and won 17. seven did you yes wow it was- i mean it says something it says something about the lions the fact that they're favored at home um this week against the vikings well i mean in years past that would have been a uh Four I, or five points spread the other way. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I just feel like they're built. They're they're building something big there long term. They are like building. They, they've yeah. they've got a lot. Of I mean, really strong. They got a the, the GM Brad Holmes. He's a hell of a GM. But is Jared Goff? But is Jared Goff your dude? Yes. You see the way he's playing now. He's playing and best and if you look career. at, I look see at your point, Anthony. I see. I see your point. I see your point because the league is all about mobility now, and I think that eventually he's going to get caught up with them. But I know a lot of people are still saying, oh, the Cowboys, the Eagles are not giving, like, you know, their due. They're, they, yes, have the best record, but they will the get up. Eagles? I, I don't I don't know how you stop that running game. Like, I don't know how, who stopped. For who? Philadelphia. For, the, for, the, for Philly? Yes. I, I Philly might be good for a while. Um, Philly might be very, very good for a while. They've got everything. And then who do they, they have? Who's first round pick this year? They have, like, a top five or top ten pick. If the Philly does, yes, I forgot I if Detroit did. Detroit has two. Rams. Yeah, Detroit has the Rams pick, boy. and that's going to be a high yeah, pick de- too. That's the fourth yeah, de- pick de- right de- now. De- so. Detroit's going to get that big boy out of uh, out of Georgia. Jalen Carter. And then your defensive, yeah, and then your defensive line is going to be ridiculous. Ridiculous. They got a good offensive yeah. line, and that's why Goff is going to succeed at home. He's deadly. He's Pro Bowl level at home. He's a little bit de- hit and miss on the road, but because their offensive line is so good. He's a traditional pocket passer. If you give him time, he's deadly. And that's why he's performing really well, because they have yeah. a really good offensive line. What would you guys think of last week? You know, Do you think Ohio State should have got into the play, uh, college playoff? No. You think USC or Alabama? US, I would, well, see, the, so, I mean, we talked about this at, at the conference. I mean, if USC had a 100% healthy quarterback. Correct. They would have won. And, Actually, and, I can't. They would have won. I can't. It, even that. if they didn't win. Even yeah. if they didn't win. I think they're, that gives them the argument to go compete in the playoffs. I'm not going to put a team in to the playoffs that's not that that that's that's not at 100 percent, especially without that big piece. I think Ohio State gets beat by over 30 points against Georgia. That's how what? bad it's going to be. Yes, 30 points. No. no. What's the line there? Probably what 14, 13. No, the line's got to be. It's it's going to be under seven. Under seven. Dude, it's Ohio State. Okay, you ready for this? I'm gonna give you the points. I think Georgia wins. Like, I'll give you, I'll give you 24 and a half points. That's how much Georgia's gonna <laughs> win. This game. You're out of your, you're out of your mind. I'm not. I'm not. Like, I think you're gonna see like a 41 to 14 type final. For what? Sure. Ohio State is not that good. Okay. And then Michigan, I see that game like a 37. The line is six and a half. The line six and a half. Georgia. I'll bet George all day long on that one, baby. Michigan, Michigan, seven and a half against TCU. They are, huh? I think that game, I think that game's an ass beating. You think Michigan ass beats them? Michigan beats the shit out of, Michigan beats the shit out of TCU. Just keep in mind, don't get that panic, but it's incredible that second half rushing attack that Michigan has. I don't know what they do at halftime with the adjustments yeah. that they make, but it is insane. Jim Harbaugh. And they're going to run that. They're going to run that down TCU's throat. And TCU isn't the same caliber of athlete that Michigan is recruiting. I really, I mean, think- these teams, once you get to this level, like the size of the athletes on Michigan, on Ohio State, on Alabama, like 
TCU is a much smaller team. Yeah. Michigan, I think, is going to manhandle them. So Fiesta Bowl is in Phoenix on New Year's Eve. Uh, Georgia and Ohio State play where? Uh, the Peach Bowl. Is that in Atlanta? Peach Bowl is in Atlanta. Yeah. yeah. And then national championships at SoFi. You guys buying tickets? That's going to be... You got buying tickets for any, uh, any of those games? No. No. I would not travel for any teams outside of Miami or uh, Florida State. Well... That's true. I will go to the Super Bowl. I will go to the Super Bowl this year if the Dolphins go. Where's the Super Bowl again this year? Super Bowl is in Arizona. It's in Arizona. That's right. Yeah. All right, gents. Well, good luck on your betting this week. And uh, thanks for the updates and the in, uh, invitation or information, I should say. And uh, look forward to seeing the podcast this week, Anthony. Yeah, pumped to get it out there. Um, right. Look forward to it. Take care. All right, good chat, guys. Talk soon, guys. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. So what'd you think of the interview? If there's any information that you want to know more of or want to learn about, then provide us with feedback by leaving a comment below. And if you like what we're producing, then feel free to subscribe to our channel, share this video with your network, and as well, click on that bell for all notifications because we would not be here without you. We appreciate it. Thanks for watching, everyone.